Right, John chapter 20 is where we're going to begin on this uh, morning. You know, have you ever thought about who Jesus showed up and revealed himself to after the resurrection? I mean, if I was in charge, I sure would have him showing up to different people. I would probably have him stop by and say hello to Pilate. <laughs> or Herod. Or maybe Caiaphas and Annas as well, right? But isn't it interesting that Jesus completely bypasses the power brokers of this world? He completely ignores the world's power. You know why? Because his will doesn't get done through the movers and the shakers of this world. The people who love him are the people that he shows himself to. The people that are with him, the people that want his presence are the people that Jesus reveals himself to because they are going to be the people that will impact the entire world because of his presence in their life. Which leads me to say this right at the outset, that if our life is going to have eternal value and significance, we need to invite Jesus' presence into our life. Have you done that? Have you received him as your personal Savior? And then if you have, are you seeking his presence to renew and to refresh your heart on a daily basis? We want to look at John 20, and I want to see in the first 10 verses the tomb emptied, and then in verses 11 to 29, lives that are filled, and then in the last few verses, the mission fulfilled that Jesus came to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just so thankful this morning for the opportunity that we have to be together. Thank you for John 20. What a wonderful, wonderful passage. It was sad when we saw Jesus so cruelly and brutally treated, crucified in the previous chapter last week. But Lord, this is a, this is a time of rejoicing. This is the real Resurrection Sunday that we have recorded here in this chapter. And I pray that that resurrection of Jesus will become something that uh, is recorded in our hearts written in our hearts by the Spirit of the living God, that we might be people who know him and the power of his resurrection in us, through us. Thank you, Lord. We're speaking to our hearts. We're expecting you to anoint both the messenger and the listener that we might accomplish the very purpose for which you gave us this passage. Your glory is what we desire, and that alone we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Really, the empty tomb, if you think about it, is the whole basis for Christianity. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there would be no Christianity. If anyone could have ever produced the body of the Lord, Christianity's over. That's the end of it. I believe that the empty tomb is probably more symbolic of the Christian faith than even the cross, because it's really the fulfillment of everything that the cross contained in it, an empty tomb. And I want you to see how it is discovered in the first, sec uh, first two verses of this chapter, where again we read the first day of the week. We know what day that is, Resurrection Sunday. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, dawn. You, you have to realize that in Jewish timekeeping, approximately 6 uh, p.m. the day before, what we would call Shabbat, 
They would call Shabbat. Well, we would call Saturday. That's when the first day of the week actually began, at sundown on Saturday. So she's coming in the early morning Sunday, just before the dawn, very early. It's yet dark, unto the sepulcher. See if the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. We know not where they have laid him. So here she has just discovered it. Mary Magdalene. She's the first one. She is devoted to the Lord. She was there at his crucifixion. And here she is, the first one to visit the tomb. I think because if anyone is grateful for what the Lord has done, it's this woman. We're told in the other Gospels that she was a woman that was possessed by demons. And Jesus cast demons out of her. And as a result, her life was absolutely transformed, as you can imagine. And so she is totally devoted to him and grateful to him for the deliverance that he brought to her. She comes, the stones removed already. She looks in and the tomb is empty. And her first thought is that grave robbers have come and stolen his body. And so with her discovery, she runs to tell the disciples. And she gets to Peter and John first and tells them. Well, what was discovered then becomes something that is examined. Look at verses 3 to 7. Because it says, therefore, Peter went forth. The other disciple came to the sepulcher. They ran both together. The other disciple did outrun Peter, came first to the sepulcher. Stooping down, he looked in. He saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. And then verse 6, Peter comes. And he went into the sepulcher. He sees the linen clothes lie. Verse 7, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. There's three different words here in these verses. I should probably pick up on verse 8 to include that as well. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Three different words for seeing in these verses. In verse 5, looked. And uh, looking in or glancing in, not looking carefully. In verse 6, it's the word seeth, which means to look at something carefully. And in verse 8, it's the word saw, which means not only to look carefully, but to understand what you've seen, to perceive and understand the significance of it. And of course, when they examined it, they realized this was not grave robbers at all. Couldn't have been. And so we get it interpreted in the 8th through the 10th verse. In fact, it says in verse 9, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. What did they see? when they looked carefully, when it says in that eighth verse that John, he saw, and at that very moment he believed. What was it that caused him to believe? What was it that he saw in that tomb that gave him understanding of the significance? Well, he saw the wrappings that were around the Lord when he was placed in that tomb, and they were totally undisturbed. They were in the same position that that body had been laid into that tomb in. The only difference is that they were partially collapsed now because they were empty, but yet they were still intact, and they retained the shape of Jesus' body. Like a cocoon. Do you know what a cocoon is? Have you ever seen a cocoon? Now, the only difference is a cocoon, of course, isn't made out of linen like these wrappings, but also a cocoon has a hole in the end where the moth or the butterfly, whatever it is, 
uh, escape that cocoon. Here is a cocoon of, of linen uh, grave wrappings that have no hole in it, which means the body is empty. This, these wrappings are empty, but the body came through the wrappings. Something supernatural happened here. There's only one way that those wrappings would lay there in that tomb undisturbed, and that is his body had supernaturally passed through those wrappings in resurrection. His body was resurrected. You know the resurrection of the human body is a promise that every single believer can claim. Because Jesus lives, we shall live also. He is simply, Paul says, the first fruits of all them that believe. And so in that future resurrection of the human body, it'll be the ultimate upgrade for our bodies. We will have bodies that will look and act like a regular physical body, but will have this kind of supernatural ability. Because what we're going to see in chapter 20 is not only that that body was able to come through those wrappings and not disturb them, but he's also in that same body able to just in a moment appear in a place without any door or window or anything being open. So obviously they will be physical bodies that will have flesh and bones on them that can be touched, that can eat because he eats with his disciples in this body. And yet they must have a different molecular structure than these bodies if they can pass through solid material and substances like this. The tomb is emptied. Well, what kind of effect does that have? on these believers that he shows himself to. The tomb is emptied, and as a result, lives are filled. Tomb is empty, lives are filled. And we pick it up in verse 11 of this 20th chapter, and we read this. Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and she sees two angels in white, sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. I never read that 12th verse without thinking of the Ark of the Covenant. On the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which is also called the mercy seat, there were two angelic creatures that were carved out of gold, pure gold. One on one end and one on the other end. Did you know that Jesus is our mercy seat? And these two angels remind me of those cherubim that, that uh, hover over the mercy seat, one at the foot and one at the head of where Jesus' body had previously lain. But the point that I want to uh, make as we look first of Mary of Magdala, that uh, she doesn't know what happened. There's actually three post-resurrection appearances recorded here in John 20. Mary is the first one that we come to. She doesn't know what's going on. She's really ignorant of what happened. But she returns to the tomb because she wants to locate his body. And the first thing that is said to her in that 13th verse by these two angels Woman, why weepest thou? Very interesting in verse 15, before she knows it's Jesus, Jesus, she thinks is the gardener. He says to her, woman, why weepest thou? Two times. Ask the same question to Mary of Magdala. Why that question? Well, the angels... And when Jesus asked that question, are not asking the question for information. They're asking that question so that they can give instruction, Jesus especially. Why are you weeping at an empty tomb? 
That empty tomb means that nothing in this life can, can destroy the promises of God. That tomb is empty. Why are you weeping over an empty tomb? If his body was in there, then weep, yeah, but it's empty. It's an empty tomb. Why weepest thou? Why do we weep over e what evil people do to us? Why do we weep over the disappointments that we experience? Why do we weep as the world does? As if we have no hope when things happen in our lives. What we need to learn to do is process it. Process it all in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. Doesn't matter what evil people do to us. God's all powerful. He's sovereign over all of that. It doesn't matter really what disappointments we experience. It's all in the purview of the purpose of God. You know what? It doesn't matter even when a loved one passes on because we know the promises that we have in this book. Let's process it all in the light of the resurrection of Christ. Why weepest thou? Now there's a reason to cry. But not over an empty tomb. And then the second question that Jesus asks her in verse 15, whom seekest thou? Why do you cry? Who are you seeking? Now, that's a good question, too. Who are we seeking? Who was she seeking? Well, obviously, she was seeking a dead Christ. She was seeking a crucified Christ who was still buried and still dead. Of course, we need to understand Christ and seek him as the crucified one. There's a place for that, for sure. If you haven't ever understood that he was wounded for your transgressions, he was bruised for your iniquity, the chastisement of your peace was uh, upon him. And with his stripes, you're healed because you, like all of us, as sheep have gone astray and we have turned every single one of us to our own way. And so the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and we need to seek a crucified Christ He's a savior. Never forget, he's a crucified Christ. Even to you as a believer, he's the crucified one. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. So we get reminders periodically of what we owe him, how much he loves us, and how we must love him in return because he is Jesus the crucified. But he's all, whom seekest thou, Jesus says. Who are you seeking? Are you merely seeking a crucified Christ? Are you seeking the risen Christ? Paul's watchword, Paul's motto, Paul's desire in life that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. He was seeking the resurrected Christ. She wasn't. Jesus promises Actually, through the prophecy, that same Isaiah 53 prophecy, that he would divide the portion with the strong. That's resurrection language in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He is the one that would declare this to future generations, the prophecy of the cross, Psalm 22 and verse 22. Seek the risen Christ, not just the crucified Christ, but the living, risen Christ. For the believer, the living, risen Christ is at the very center of our lives. That's where the power resides. In fact, we are told in Ephesians chapter 1 that because he is the risen Christ, he is the all-powerful Christ. That's why he says uh, before his ascension on the Mount of Olives, he says, all authority, all power is mine, both in heaven and in earth, because he is the risen Christ. Seek the risen Christ. And I should also say, in the 17th verse, when he reveals himself to her, 
he tells her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Don't cling to me because I have not yet ascended. When he ascended, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He became the enthroned Christ. In other words, Mary, who are you seeking? Don't seek a dead Christ. Seek a, a Christ that was crucified but is now risen, is living, and is and will be the enthroned Christ. And when he becomes the enthroned Christ, you have a totally new relationship with him. You don't cling to a physical body. You now cling in a spiritual relationship to the very heart of Christ himself. And then a third thing in this meeting with Mary is uh, what is she supposed to do? He tells her in verse 17, go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father to my God and your God. If you doubted or you have denied Jesus, Seek the risen Christ is basically the message here. All of those disciples, he calls them his brethren. Well, they all ran away on him. They all totally failed him. They fled for fear. They left him high and dry, so to speak. They forsook him. They abandoned him when the heat was on them because they were cowards. Yeah, just like us. They were fearful. And yet he says to her, hey, go tell them. I still love him. I'm still in a relationship with him. I'm going to my father, but that's their father too, your father. I'm going to my God, but that's your God too. So if you have doubted me, you've doubted my resurrection, if you have denied my name, that's all right. Seek the risen Christ, and he'll turn your sorrow into joy, and he will replace your hopeless attitude with hopefulness. Seek to honor him like Mary did. One thing I can say about her, she's a woman, not a man that's coming to the, the tomb first. She's a woman. In Jewish life, they were not on the same level with men. But how Jesus turns the culture and everything on its head, right? Right. And here is this woman, and one example to us. See the diligence? She seeks to honor the Lord, and she is diligent. She is there early in the morning. She is there till late at night. She doesn't want to leave his side. She's seeking him personally. You know, there's no group plan in seeking the Lord. It's a personal thing. It's something that you have to do personally. Even if your spouse doesn't do it, you have a responsibility to personally seek God. It's a personal thing. She's obedient. You, you know, it doesn't always work out the way you think it will. It didn't work out the way that they thought it was going to work out. That's why they were disappointed and depressed. It's, a, it's obedience, nevertheless. I remember reading about American prisoners during World War II that were in a German concentration camp, and they got word toward the end that uh, the war was over. But the German uh, guards and those in charge of this concentration camp didn't know the, that, that message. And for three days, these American prisoners knew it before it actually happened. And you know what? Their attitudes were different. They still had the same brutal treatment for those three days, but they had a total different attitude. You know why? Because they knew that the war was over and they had hope. And that's exactly what we see here. When you seek a risen Christ, when you understand what that involves, that empty tomb, it fills your life with hope. Lives are filled. Well, the second post-resurrection appearance of Jesus is not merely to one person like Mary, but is in this chapter, to 10 of 
what is left of 11 disciples, because one's missing. Thomas is missing. And we'll pick it up here in verse 19. And it says, then the same day, that is on that first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, 10 of them, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and he said, Peace be unto you. When he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord. See how sorrow turns to joy? Then said Jesus to them again, 21, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But verse 24, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, or the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So here he is revealing himself to ten of the 11 disciples that are left. And when he shows up in the midst, that must have been startling to them, to say the least. There he is, all of a sudden. He's visible to them in that room. He didn't come through the locked door. He just appeared. And he tells them, first, peace be unto you. They were fearful. That's why they ran away. That's why they're hiding behind locked doors. They're fearful. And he wants to take that fear and he wants to remove it by giving them his peace. In fact, one of the things that he told them in that upper room before the crucifixion is peace. I leave you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth. And here he is again, speaking peace to them, replacing their fear and their troubled and depressed attitudes with his peace. You know, that's the word shalom in Hebrew, right? And it means to be whole, to be complete, to be sound. And so shalom or peace that he speaks of. That, that peace is really the basis for Christian living and ministry. You can't live the Christian life or minister effectively without having Jesus's peace in your heart. In fact, if you don't have that, people are going to upset you, things are going to upset you, and you'll bomb out. You'll, you'll, you're crashed and burned, so to speak. Unless you exchange your happenings for his peace. So he speaks peace to them. And then he gives them proof that he is the risen Christ. In that 20th verse, he shows them his wounds. He shows them his scars. You know, Christianity and believing the resurrection of Jesus is not something that requires blind faith, a leap in the dark. But there is solid evidence. He gives them solid evidence. The scripture gives us solid evidence. There is extra biblical material that proves the truth of God's word. In verse 21, he gives them purpose. These guys that abandoned him, he hasn't given up on them. He speaks peace to them. He gives them a purpose. Look at verse uh, uh, 21. As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. I want you to share in my mission. Remember what his mission was? He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I want you to share in my mission. Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That's his mission. And he says, as the Father sent me on that mission, I'm sending you on that mission. I am commissioning you. Share the, minute, the, the mission with me. And then how can that be accomplished? 
Well, he gives them the power, verse 22. He breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whenever I read that verse, I think of Genesis 2, 7, where man is created out of the dust of the ground, and God breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul, physically. Here is Jesus breathing on them spiritually. You know, it is impossible to live as a Christian or to serve the Lord as a believer without the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life and upon your life. Here, I believe, he is, a, he is temporarily imparting the Holy Spirit to strengthen them in anticipation of the greatest anointing and empowering on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come upon them in mighty power. And he gives them purpose and tells them what their proclamation is supposed to be in verse 23. And basically, it's you're to preach a message of forgiveness. You're to preach a message of release from sin. You're to proclaim a message that people can be set free from sin. Not only, not only from the penalty of sin, but also from its grip, from its power over you. Not only from sin itself, but also from the guilt and the stain that sin leaves behind in a conscience and in a life. Preach forgiveness. Preach deliverance of sin, from sin. Freedom, release. Then the third post-resurrection appearance of Jesus is to the 11. That is, the previous 10 plus this time. Thomas is among them. And we see that happening. In verse 25, the other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Remember, he says, well, I won't believe that until I see for myself, in other words. Verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were within. They were in that same upper room, locked. Thomas was with them this time. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, appeared in their midst, said the same thing, peace be unto you. And then he speaks specifically to Thomas. Isn't that interesting how the Lord individualizes, tailors his message to individual people? Do you experience that? that? You know, where God's speaking to me when you read your Bible or when there's a message. God makes it personal to you. He speaks to Thomas, and he says, Thomas, I wasn't there, but I heard what you said. I know what you said. So go ahead. Reach hither your finger. Behold my hands. Reach hither your hand. Thrust it into my side. And then here's the rebuke. Stop being faithless. Start believing is basically what he's saying here. We talk about doubting Thomas, and I think he gets a bad rap in some ways because Thomas is a, he's no different than any of us. And one thing about Thomas is that he was a very loyal disciple of the Lord. I know at the end they all ran, but he was willing, I think it's in chapter 11, before they went to the grave of Lazarus, he said, yeah, let's go and die with him. He's willing to die at that point anyway. That's what he said. Thomas, he doubts. He doubts. You know, there's different categories of doubt. For instance, some people doubt or say they doubt or don't believe because they want to they want to cover their sin. They want that to be a cover for their sin. So, oh, yeah, no, I, I, I can't believe that because they want to continue in a sinful life. But there are others that they really hate their doubt. They wish they wouldn't doubt. And I think Thomas falls into that category. But there's some factors why Thomas doubted. And see if you can identify with any of these. I think, first of all, he probably is called Doubting Thomas, and had this lapse because his personality, the way he was wired, uh, his personality, he was very sensitive. As I read 
the little bit that's in the Bible about Thomas, he's a very sensitive person. He's a loyal person, as I've already said, and he's failed big time. So guess what that equals? Depression. He's sensitive. Maybe he's melancholic. And he's loyal. And he blew it all. So he's really feeling low. But he's also, like the other disciples, confused. He's confused. He's perplexed. He didn't think. He didn't understand, even though Jesus said it on several occasions, you know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed by the chief priests and the elders. But in the, in the three days, I'm going to rise again. He didn't get that. None of them got that. He didn't understand the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so as a result, there's perplexity. He's confused. Also, he's disappointed. The events that have happened did not offer hope to him. They were much different than what he had hoped would happen. And so he suffered deep disappointment as a result. But here's the biggie. In verse uh, 24, it's very clear that when Jesus showed up the first time, he wasn't there. You know why, why he wasn't there? Because depressed, defeated people isolate themselves. They withdraw themselves from the fellowship of God's people. They want to be alone. And yet that's the worst thing that a person can do to themselves. When you are depressed, when you are disappointed, when you're confused, the worst thing you can do is isolate yourself. But that's what he did. He wanted to be alone. And as a result of that, guess what? He missed the presence of the Lord. Whenever we withdraw ourselves, from the fellowship of God's people, we very often miss the presence of the Lord that otherwise would be the very answer to the thing that we're struggling with. Jesus is the answer. The presence of the Lord is what you need to get in. The presence of the Lord is what we need the most. And wherever you can find his presence, make a beeline for that place. He wanted to be alone. Well, Jesus, as I said, rebukes him. Really a gentle rebuke in verse 27. God's very gracious. He stopped becoming faithless and start becoming believing. And of course, this really breaks him. And he says in verse 28, my Lord and my God. It's the goodness of the Lord, Paul says, that should lead us to repentance. And God's so gracious to him, even in this gentle rebuke that he brings to him. He gives him a chance again. And then he gives instruction. He says in verse 29, Thomas because you've seen me, you believed. But I want to say, the people that are blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. Well, what does that mean? It does not mean that there is no evidence for faith in the risen living Christ. It doesn't mean that we place blind faith because he says very clearly, John, in the next verse, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, and they're not written in this book. But what is written in this book is that you might believe, you might have faith that Jesus is the Christ. The signs are the miracles. There's so much evidence that faith should be the natural result of it. And so he, he, he says, look, you're not called to blind faith. You're not called to jump off the cliff in the dark. You're given solid evidence. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. 
That's the kind of faith that we have in the scripture that we're called to believe when he says, stop becoming faithless and start becoming believing. That's what he means when he says, blessed are they that have not seen, that is, physically, and yet have placed faith, have placed dependence on the Lord. I've never seen the Lord physically. Neither have you. But you and I, we confess that we believe him without ever having seen him. We believe a lot of things by faith without ever having seen them. And everyone has faith. Atheists have faith. They have a faith system. They have a belief system. They don't want to admit that, but that's what it is. It's a belief system. We have a belief system that is solidly founded in evidence and a substance. And so he says, blessed are those that haven't seen and yet believe. And then the mission that Jesus fulfilled in the 30th and 31st verse, basically it's about the fulfillment of Jesus's ministry and the fulfillment of John's gospel, this book. And it's based upon verse 30, select signs. See the word signs in verse 30? We got our English word semantics from that word translated signs. Semantics is the meaning of words, meaning that the, the signs or the miracles revealed the very meaning of who Jesus is. The meaning of Jesus, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Remember, the book is built around many signs, many miracles, but there are seven I am's as well that Jesus uses in that gospel to reveal himself as the Son of God. And then there's just a single subject in this book of John, in the Bible, you might say. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The single subject is Jesus himself, that he is the Messiah, that he is deity, that he is the Son of God, and that uh, God's life, which is eternal, is experienced by receiving him. That's exactly what it means to believe upon him. It says that believing you might have life through his name. It means to receive him. He, he tells us that in the very outset of the gospel in verse 12 of chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Believe and receive are parallel truths. They're the same thing. So to believe on Jesus is to receive him. Have you received him? And are you continuing to receive his life that he infuses into you as you depend upon him to do so? Years ago, famous British agnostic by the name of Thomas Huxley had to leave early one morning to go from one speaking assignment to another. So he got into a horse-drawn taxi to go from his hotel to the train station, and he just assumed that the hotel doorman had told the driver of the carriage that they were to go to the train station. And so when he got in, he simply said to the driver, go fast, and off they went. And after a short while, Huxley realized, wait a minute, we're not going in the right direction to the train station. We're going the opposite way. So he yelled to the driver, do you know where you're going? And the driver looked back and he said, no, sir, but I'm driving fast. <laughs> Obviously, it doesn't matter how fast we go if we're going in the wrong direction. And yet many people, even believers, are really headed in the wrong direction. They're not living their life in line with the purpose of God for their life. 
John's purpose in writing this gospel, he tells us in the last two verses, especially verse 31, he tells us is that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He wants us to believe that the risen Jesus is our Lord and our God, as Thomas confessed. And if Jesus is anything less than the eternal Lord and God, then it would be a horrible sin to worship him. But if he is, and I believe he is, Lord and God, it would be a horrible sin not to worship him, not to submit to him, not to follow him, not to submit to him.